Hi! It's been a long time since I posted my reading of a book. I've been reading lots of books, but I haven't really been posting them online. But today, we will be reading a really fun book. I promise. So, it's called In the Year of the Boar and Jackie Robinson by Betty Bow Lord, the author of Spring Moon. Maybe I could read that soon. So, anyways, let's begin. Chapter 1, January, Chinese New Year. In the year of the dog, 4645, there lived halfway across the world from New York, a girl called Sixth Cousin, otherwise known as Bandit. One winter morning, a letter arrived at the house of Wong from her father, who had been traveling the four seas. On the stamp sat an ugly, bold bird. Maybe it was a vulture. The paper was blue. When Mother read it, she smiled. But the words made, a, made a Grandmother cry and Grandfather angry. No one gave Sixth Cousin even the smallest hint of why. It is so unfair, she thought. Must I drool like Chow Chow, eyeing each mouthful until someone is good and ready to toss a scrap my way? If Father was here, he'd tell. He would never treat me like a child, like a girl, like a nobody. Still, Bandit dared not ask. How many times had she been told that no proper member of an upright Confucian family ever questioned the conduct of elders? Or that children must wait until invited to speak? Countless times. Only the aged were considered wise. Ah, that's unfair. Even the opinion of her father the youngest son of the patriarch did not matter. No wonder had he, no wonder he had gone away to seek his fortune. She tried to pretend nothing had happened, but it was hard. All day the elders behaved unnaturally in her presence. No unintended slights, quick nods, easy smiles teasing remarks or harsh words. They were so kind, too kind. Bandit felt as if she had sprouted a second head, and they were all determined to ignore politely the unsightly growth. That evening, as she and fourth cousin sat on the bed playing pickup beans, she confided in her best friend. Something's happened, something big has happened. Oh, said the older girl, you are always imagining things. Remember the time you told everyone there was a goldfish swimming in the bamboo trees? <laughs> it was only a fallen kite. Remember the time you overheard the cook plotting to murder the washerwoman? He was only sharpening his cleaver to kill a hen. Aw, poor little hen. Bandit scowled as she scattered the dried lima beans. That was then. Now is now. All right, all right, sighed your dearest friend. What has happened now? That's it. I don't know, she answered. Well, then let's play. My turn. Sixes. No, shouted Bandit, grabbing the other girl's hands. Think, think. What would make mother smile, grandmother cry, and grandfather angry? Fourth cousin shrugged her shoulders and began to unbraid her hair. She was always fussing with her hair. Bandit thought and thought and thought, annoyed at her friend's silence, sorry that no matter how fourth cousin tried, she would never be pretty. Aww. Soon the coals in the brazier were dying, and suddenly the room was cold. The cousins scrambled under their covers. The beans tumbled onto the floor. 
Bandit knew she should pick them up, but she just stayed put. She had thinking to do. Finally, Bandit had the answer. Fourth cousin was asleep. Wake up! Wake up! Mm. Listen, I've got it. Remember the time the enemy planes bombed the city for two straight days and we had to hide in the caves with only hard-boiled eggs to eat? What happened when we came home? Who cares? Father bought us that pony of a dog. Mother thought it was cute and smiled. But grandmother was frightened and cried and hid behind the moon gate. And grandfather was very angry. He said, youngest son, are you mad? Unless you mean for us to eat that beast, take him away. Take him away this minute. I think that it could have been a Great Dane because they are the largest dog breed ever. His voice was as cold as the northwest wind. Bandit stood up and threaded her hands into her sleeves as Grandfather did. She cleared her throat the way he did whenever he was displayed <coughs> and stomped up and down the bed. Fourth cousin never opened an eye. She turned on her side and curled up like a shrimp. A shrimp swimming around in the ocean, eating algae and stuff. I do not know what shrimp eats, so I'm just gonna go with that. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me see, where, where was it? Here we go. Bandit pounced on here. Don't you see? Father is bringing the dog back. Never. Bandit thought it over and sighed. You're right. You're always right. Quietly, very quietly, she slipped under the covers. Sleep still would not come. Bandit heard the sounds of laughter and voices, footfalls and bicycle bells. Ding, ding, ding. As guests departed from one court, then another. It was the season for merrymaking. When the new year approaches and old debts are paid. At last, the lanterns among the, among the, along the, sorry, along the garden walk were snuffed out and the room was dark. Bandit reached out. Fourth cousin's hand was warm. Through the wall came faint, oh, through the wall came faint strains of a song. Mother was playing father's record again. The music carried Bandit away. Thousands of miles to the sea. Its waters were not muddy like the river of golden sands that churned at the bottom of the mountain of 10,000 steps on which the house of Wong was perched. The sea was calm, deep green like jade. As far as the heavens, the skies soared. In the distance, something blue. A boat in the shape of a bird. Slowly, it floated toward shore. She shaded her eyes to get a better look. Whoa, what is that? On the deck was Father. She shouted and waved, but he did not seem to hear. Father! Father, I'm here! Dad! <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Slowly, it floated towards shore. She shaded her eyes to get a better look. Huh? On the deck was Father. She shouted and waved, Father, Father. But he did not seem to hear, Father, Father. She shouted until she was hoarse, Father, Father. <coughs> then she ran into the sea, forgetting she could not swim. Soon she was just a fingertip away. Father! Father! Her cries angered the sleeping demons of the deep, and they sent a wall of water to quiet the intruder. Splash! She awoke. Her face was wet. Look what you've made me do, you bandit! 
She sat up to find fourth cousin gone and awaiting marriage, the servant sprawled on the floor. Beside the old woman was a shattered water urn. Bes uh, all about the offend all oh, sorry. All about the offending beans. You beans, you made awaiting marriage slip and drop a water urn. Go away, beans, get cleaned up. Before Bandit could apologize, a waiting marriage screwed up her skinny face and wailed. I think that actually sounded more of a goat, more like a goat than a human. The sight was ugly enough to frighten the devil himself. Cook was right. One hundred wedding trunks could not buy a waiting marriage, even a hunchbacked, lame-footed husband. Bannon, I've got you this time. This time you have to answer to your grandmother. I'm going to show her the pieces. The servant stood up, shaking a fragment in Bandit's face. Bandit brushed her hand away. It's nothing but crockery, no mean urn. Awaiting marriage squeezed out a wicked smile. Aha! You've forgotten it's New Year's time. Yes, Bandit, New Year's time. Giggling, ah ha 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 The servant scurried out. Amita Ba! Bandit was in trouble, deep trouble. Grandmother was the matriarch of the house of Wong. What she ordered was always done. What she said was always so. How many times had she warned against breaking things during the holidays? It would bring bad luck. Bad luck for the next 365 days. <gasps> That's a whole year. And if anything made grandmother unreasonable, it was bad luck. Quickly, Bandit got out of bed, used what was left him in Fourth Cousin's water urn to wash, dressed, plaited her hair, and then began seriously to clean the room. That was another of Grandmother's dictums. Not a speck of dust. Not a misplaced article. Everything must be in harmony to welcome the New Year. Hello, New Year! Welcome to our New Year's party. I'm really happy that you came along. And she was straightening out the shoes in the bottom of the tall rosewood brew. Awaiting marriage appeared at the door. She grinned as if greeting the matchmaker. Young, mist young mistress, she said, gloating. Young mistress, the matriarch wishes to see you in her quarters. Now? Now! With an extravagant bow, the tattletale removed herself. Oh! Bandit felt as if she had been summoned by an irate emperor. This time the punishment will be more than harsh words or three strokes of a bamboo cane. <gasps> three strokes of a bamboo cane? Swats! Oh, that would hurt. But much more. But she had to obey. No one ever disobeyed the matriarch. Quickly, she ran to the washstand and tucked a towel inside the seat of her pants. So that, so that the spanks that she will get wouldn't hurt as much. <laughs> Still, there must be some way to soften Grandmother's heart, she must think, and quickly, before another offense was added to the first. Think! Who could help? Yes, of course, naturally, Ninth Cousin, otherwise known as Precious Coins. He was the baby of the clan, the favored grandchild. When, whenever Bandit needed a few pennies to buy melon seeds or candied plums, she sent precious coins to ask Grandmother for them. The matriarch never refused him. If he would shed a bucket of tears for Bandit, 
perhaps her life would be spared. Where could that fat little boy be? He hated to walk, loved being carried. With all the cousins getting ready for the festivities, he was probably still sitting on his bed like a Buddha, waiting for a pair of feet. <laughs> She ran out the door, along the gallery, past Mother's room, through the rock garden, through the rock garden into the next court, which belonged to Third Uncle. She tiptoed past his study. Uncle hated to be disturbed when he was doing accounts, and that's all he ever did. She heard him muttering as he clicked the beads on his abacus, figuring out new ways to pocket a cent. One little penny cent. Poor third aunt. No matter how she screamed, ah, and schemed, her husband refused to loosen her, his purse strings. Unlike father, he never squandered money for gifts. But he seldom reaped joy either. Aww. Precious Coins was sitting on his bed. As soon as Bandit stepped into the room, he held out his arms. She could not resist giving him a big hug. He was as cute as a dumpling and just as round. Ooh, so cute. See, Grandmother, now? Yes, but no pennies today. When I set you down, you must hold on to my leg. Don't let go, no matter what. A new game, see? Hold leg. No let go. If I let go, if you let go, you lose. No let go. Precious Coins held up his arms again. Scooping him up, she walked slowly along the pathway past the Lotus Pond and crossed the Half Moon Bridge to the Matriarch's quarters. At the threshold, Bandit hesitated. What took more courage, to enter or to run away? Inside sat all the women of the older generation, even grand, grand, grand auntie, who was 93. That is really old. It only proved grandmother's warning to be true. Bad luck. It was already here. Granddaughter, you may come in. Holding precious coins even tighter, Bandit inched towards the inch towards the carved ebony chair in the center of the room. She kept her eyes on grandmother's bound feet, which rested on a stool. She set the boy down. At once he, pl at once he plopped to the floor and put his arms around her left leg. He's so cute and squishy. Good morning, grandmother, she whispered still keeping her eyes on grandmother's feet. They were very tiny, like little red peppers. Maybe grandmother was doing foot binding to make her feet dainty or something. I don't really know much about foot binding. Look at me, child. I have something important to say. 100 lashes, 10,000 characters to copy, 100,000 hours in her room? If only she had picked up the beans. Blinking away the tears, Bandit looked up. Her eyes met the matriarchs. No one spoke. Bandit looked around, searching for a friendly face among the women. No one smiled, not even, not even mother. Granddaughter. Today is one of the saddest days in my long life, in all our lives. You, my sixth grandchild, must go away, far away. No, how can I? Bandit thought. I am too young. Who will take care of me? A tear fell, then another. Grandmother, she begged, let me have another chance. I will be careful. I will never, ever, as long as I live, break another thing during the holidays. I promise, please don't send me away. What are you talking about? I am not sending you away. You are going away because your father has sent for you and your mother. 
has decided not to return to Chongqing. He plans to make America his home. Your grandfather has agreed. The letter! No wonder Mother had smiled, Grandmother had cried, and Grandfather had been so angry. Oh, Father, she thought, at long last, we'll be together again. Bandit could not help smiling. She was a brimful of happiness, but then she saw the sadness on Grandmother's face and ran to comfort her. Boom! Bandit fell. True to his word, Precious coins had not let go of her leg. Then all the women of the house of Wong gathered around to fuss over her. Oh, you poor thing, they cried. What's to become of you? Exiled like a criminal to a distant land, with no clan to nurture you. Surrounded by strangers, strangers who aren't even Chinese. And those cowboys and Indians. What kind of place is that for a child to grow up in? Dodging bullets and arrows? No, that's either a very long time ago or just on TV. You'll starve! Imagine eating nothing but warm puppies and raw meat. How will you become civilized? America does, America does not honor Confucius. America is foreign, so foreign. On and on they went, wailing like paid mourners at a funeral. But Bandit was not afraid. She had faith in her father. Nothing awful will happen, she told herself. No bad luck. The year of the boar would bring travel, adventure, and double happiness. Yay! The final day of the year of the dog <coughs> lasted until dawn. No one slept. Not even little dumpling precious coins. For tradition had long decreed that a bad dream on any New Year's Eve was an omen of bad tomorrows. To make sure no one had a nightmare, all the beds in the house of Wong stood empty until the skies were lit by dawn and the danger passed. The lofty hall of ancestors were fest was festooned with holiday banners and graced with clansmen from near and far. They formed clusters of color like the glass pieces of kaleidoscope. Everyone's gown was of bright silk and brocade, and many were embroidered with gold and silver threads and lined in fur, or stitched with sequins and pearls. Ooh! A few gowns, like bandits, betrayed the twelve-course dinner the clansmen had consumed earlier. It did not matter. At the New Year's feast, no one ever scolded, even if a barbarian should wash his face in the soup. <laughs> That's funny. A few faces, like bandits, could use a washing, even in soup. <laughs> they were streaked with ash, for they had leaned too close to the sizzle of the firecrackers. Ooh, firecrackers. Pop, pop, poppity pop, 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 pop. But even so, no cross words. On New Year's Eve, exceptions were the rule. Gamblers seated at a dozen tables chanted and cheered as they vied at Mad John. Cards and rhyming couplets, while would-be singing warriors and courtesans, tagged after the tunes the musicians played and the servants spinning like tops, woo, spinning around, circled the floor with drinks and delicacies. At each stop, they collected a generous tip. Near daybreak of New Year's Day, even the third uncle forgot himself. Before the altar, which was laden with offerings for the ancestors, Grandfather sat, telling stories to the very old and the very young. Many in his audience were fighting sleep. Their stomachs were filled with sweets. 
Their pockets were red with envelopes containing money from the elders. Their heads with stories of monkey kings and fox fairies. Oh, I think I watched a movie about a monkey king that was flying around and had to sit in, in a five finger mountain for 500 years. Okay, anyway. Noble ministers and celestial fools. Loyal sons, forgetful magpies. Tweet, tweet. The weaving maid who lived on the far side of the river of stars. No wonder they drooped. Not bandaged, she was wide awake, sitting cross-legged, holding hands with the grand uncle and his wife of 60 years, who, for as long as bandit could recall, had refused to address her husband. Both the old artist and the former beauty had long forgotten his misdeed. The date of it, however, was enshrined in memory and dubbed Foul Friday. Perhaps in the beginning, the wife might have relented. Then it became unthinkable. Now, in his old age, Grand Grand Uncle delighted in painting Grand Grand Auntie's oh, portrait, sometimes with warts. <laughs> Sometimes with big feet or donkey grins. Always fanciful. Bandit thought each picture worth 10,000 laughs. Secretly, she collected them, whispering to Grand Grand Auntie that she did so on her behalf. Thus, both artist and subject adored her. Thus, Bandit had become the official go-between. And so finally, the worthy peasant could sleep peacefully in his grave. Everyone applauded. Glancing up at the feuding husband and wife, Bandit saw tears in their eyes. If only, she thought, if only they could be friends again before I go away, then they will not need a go-between. For the first time, Bandit felt a little bit sad to be going away. Grandfather tapped his pipe on the arm of his chair. Tap, tap, tap. Calling for attention, suddenly the hall was still. It's almost time to go to bed, my clansmen. But before we can, there is something we must do. Sixth cousin, rise and come to my side. Bandit jumped to her feet and obeyed. Grandfather was the patriarch of the clan, even more powerful than grandmother. Everyone was now looking her way. Bandit blushed. Now, now, my child, Grandfather said with a smile. Since when have you become so shy? Everyone laughed, the cousins the loudest. Taking his pipe again, Grandfather continued. As you know, my youngest son's wife and daughter will be leaving this week. There will be still the time enough to say a proper goodbye. But we must not send a sixth cousin away without giving her an official name. Bandit will not do it, will it? No, shouted the House of Wong. So, tell me, good child, do you have a preference? I, Grandfather? Who else? Bandit looked to the rafters, as if a hint may be hidden there. Everyone waited quietly. Finally, she replied, Grandfather, since I am going to America, I, I would like an American name. Some nodded approval. Others shook their head. An American name? Grandfather stroked his white beard. Whoops. <laughs> the page closed on me. Oh, we got the page again. Then he said, American name it is. Now everyone nodded approval. Bandit clapped. Fourth cousin did too. My dearest friend, Bandit thought, I wish you were going with us. Again, she felt sad. Any suggestion, my child? Grandfather asked. She had not been prepared for that. 
Everyone knew she did not speak English, but if she admitted it now, everyone enjoyed a big laugh just the same. She looked at the rafters again. I must know an American name, she thought. I must. Suddenly, what came to her? How about Uncle Sam? she shouted. <laughs> some laughed until some cried. Bandit felt that her face was as red as a fried lobster. <laughs> Grandfather came to her rescue. I myself do not care for the sound of it. How about something more melodious? Think, she must know another American name. Then it came to her. Yes, that was it. Everyone loved her movies. She was just about the most famous movie star in all the world. <gasps> Shirley Temple. For a minute, no one moved. Then Grandfather applauded. Then so did everyone else. Grandfather tapped his pipe once more, calling the clansmen to order. Straightening his back, he pronounced the official word. I, as patriarch, do hereby advise my clansmen that my sixth grandchild, the 33rd member of the House of Wong, now living under the ancestral roofs and one of the 39th generation registered in the clan book, will now be known as Shirley Temple Wong.